ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. service. I just think during Christmas with the music and the energy, Luis and I are not necessary. We should just get to sit and listen. Um, I know how busy this season is and all the comings and the goings and the extras. And, and so it makes me especially grateful to have this time, the way that God calls us together to just set aside and listen and worship and be with one another. And so I am so grateful to do that with you today. And for those that are joining us online, welcome to you. If you are visiting with us today, I just wanna remind you or draw your attention to the fact that we have these connect cards in the seat pockets in front of you. And that's a great place for you to put your information so that we can reach out to you during the week. You can fill it out and turn it into any member of our host team. We also have space for prayer requests on the back of the card. Um, praying with and for each other is one of the most important things that we can do as a church body. And so you can fill that out and turn that into any member of our host team. Our prayer wall is also open throughout the entire service. So we encourage you to, to lay down um, what God is putting on your heart so that we can be in prayer about that with you. Um, as we continue through this Advent season, there are lots of things going on. I'm going to uh, turn to the news in a second, but I'm going to encourage you to hop onto the website because we have Christmas Eve times posted there, um, information about all these different events that pop up, and it's a great place to find it all in one place. But let's take a look at what we're highlighting this morning.
Well, hey friends, Christmas is one of our favorite times of year, and we're planning again for great celebrations on December 24th, Christmas Eve. I hope you'll come, celebrate, invite your friends and your neighbors to join us. Uh, but today, let me take a minute just to lift up two other options. First, on Sunday, December 17th, at 5 p.m. at the Jones Road campus in the sanctuary, we'll be hosting a special silent night service. We, we call it a service of hope and healing. And during this service, we just acknowledge that some of us in this holiday season, it, it can be a difficult time. So if you're grieving a loss of any kind, this is a time to worship, but maybe in a little bit lower key, to light candles together and to remember the quiet hope that Jesus offers. Or maybe you have travel plans that prevent you from joining your Foundry family on Christmas Eve. We're planning something new this year, and I named this the Traveler Service. It will be like our Christmas Eve services, but it will happen a few days early. So hopefully you can worship with us before you head out of town for Christmas. This service is gonna be at the Fry Road campus on Thursday evening, December 21st at 7 p.m. Uh, whenever you can make it, please come and bring friends and we look forward to celebrating Jesus' birth with you. Good morning, Foundry family. We're so excited that today is the day of our service, The Way to the Manger, our family Christmas event. It starts at four o'clock at the Fry Road campus. It's not too late for you to come and just join us. It's going to be an incredible time that you are not going to want to miss as you get your family gathered together to really kick off the Christmas season and do it in a special way that your family is not going to want to miss. We can't wait to see you this afternoon at four o'clock. These past few years have brought many challenges, not just for Foundry, but for our community and our country. But they've also brought so many opportunities, opportunities to see God at work, to witness his faithfulness and his provision, opportunities to witness lives changed, healing, hope, and restoration. Now it's time to celebrate the goodness of God. We wanna invite you to join us for a celebration concert on January 19th featuring the worship group Leland. Invite friends and family to celebrate with us through music, prayer, and more. Concert begins at 7 p.m. with the doors opening at 5.30 for a pre-concert reception. Tickets go on sale December 19th and all proceeds will benefit our mission partner, Compassion International. Tickets would make a great Christmas gift for anyone who loves a party or anyone who just could use a little hope and joy to start the year. Find all details at foundrychurch.org slash concert. This Sunday marks the second Sunday in the season that we call Advent, where we celebrate that Christ has come to us in a manger as a tiny baby, and that as he lived and died for us, our assurance is that Christ will come again. As part of this tradition, we light these candles of the Advent wreath that help remind us of the hope peace, joy, and love that we find in Christ Jesus, our Savior. And so it is a special privilege to get to share this um, duty with our confirmation students. And Zane is here today to lead us in our reading. From Isaiah chapter 40, verses three through five. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Amen. Zane lights the candle of peace for us today. 
We know Jesus in his own words said that peace does not come to us in this world the way that the world brings it, but in an ultimate, eternal, and everlasting way. Would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, God, we, we receive your presence and we welcome it here this morning. And I know that there are a lot of things going on in the lives of those gathered here. I know that there's a lot going on in this season and then just life in general, that surely the things like, like health and finances and, and families and relationships and circumstances, none of that stops just because it is the Christmas and Advent season. And so, Lord, as we light this candle today, I pray your peace. I pray your peace would fall over all who are gathered here. Where healing is needed, comfort, provision. Lord, I pray the peace that only you can bring. And that as we worship today, as we contemplate what your word is and your message for us today, that we would not only be recipients of this peace, but bearers of it. For you are good, O oh God, and we praise your holy name. And in Jesus' name we say, amen. Friends, let us continue to praise in Jesus' name as we worship together. God of Jacob, great I am, King of angels, Son of man, voice of many waters, song of heaven's throne, louder than the thunder, make your glory known. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, 
So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm going to sing this song over you today as a reminder of the gift that God gave us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Love divine, starling angels gave a sign. Bow to babe on bended knee, the savior of humanity. Unto us a child is born. shall reign forevermore. Nowhere, nowhere, come and see what God has done. Nowhere, nowhere, the storm Son of man, there before the world began, born to suffer, born to save, born to raise us from the grave, Christ the ever.
Friends, there's so much to celebrate this time of year with special events like our concert last Sunday, uh, which was just a fabulous time together and just uh, ushered in the spirit of the season. Um, baptisms every week, it seems like we're having more and more baptisms. So much to celebrate. Uh, I want to just thank you for the ways that you give to God's work at Foundry as we pause each week and reflect on our partnership in that way. Um, we do rely on year-end giving for a big portion of our budget, and we want to finish this year in a strong place financially. So I just want to ask you and encourage you to remember Foundry as you make those plans to give at the end of the year. Um, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the ways you give. And uh, may God continue to do his work here of helping people know, follow, and share Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the ways that you provide for our needs for the ways that this season reminds us of the greatest gift of all. And I pray, God, that you would take our gifts and our whole lives, use them for your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
church all over the room. We're going to sing this song together. Can you stretch your hands to Jesus this morning? Jesus, you heard your children. You hear your children. You are the you, Jesus. Come and feel us, Jesus. Come and feel me. We want more of you, Jesus. Come and feel me. Oh, how we need you. Come and feel me. God, how we need you. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for blessing us to live another day, oh God. God, we are acknowledging that we can't live, move, or breathe without you. We need you in our lives, oh God. So, Father, we give you permission, God, to blow our minds, God, to have your way with us, oh God. Let your will be done, God. Let your will be done, not ours, oh God. We lay our will and our plan down for yours, oh God, because we're nothing without you. Holy Spirit, we need you, God. Our loved ones need you, Father. God, I pray right now for broken families, oh God, for broken marriages, oh God, for broken relationships right now, God. God, we pray for this world right now, God. This world needs you, Jesus. 
So Holy Spirit, have your way, God. God, we pray for every wounded, broken soul that have walked into this room, God. And we pray, Holy Spirit, God, that they do not walk out the way they came in. Father, touch the hearts of your people this morning, God. We love you and we bless you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I remember as a child wondering what God looked like. Have you ever wondered what God looked like? Have you ever sat around and, and thought about it? Like, actually see him, what that would be. Like, does he look like Gandalf? You know, from Lord of the Rings? Is it Morgan Freeman? Like, kind of stuck with me, with Bruce Almighty. Does he have a beard? I don't know, I don't know. Does he all dress in white? Is he supposed to? What's his laundry bill like? What are the colors of his eyes? Do, do they twinkle? When he smiles, do you hear a little ding in heaven every time he looks at you? Like I've always wondered stuff like that about God, but I think within all of us there is a desire to know, to see our creator at some level. And I'm not talking about like Dorothy wanting to peek behind the curtain and just seeing the wizard. This idea of seeing God denotes a relationship. It denotes proximity at some level and intimacy of some kind. And after God had led the people of Israel from Egypt's captivity, he gave them specific instructions when he led them into the wilderness. He says, I want you to build a tabernacle. And this is a place of worship, a sanctuary. But before the tabernacle was being built, Moses, away from the camp, the way it was set up, he would have this tent of meeting where he would go and meet with God. And there were a pillar that would come in form of a cloud over the tent where Moses was. And people could see him from a distance at this meeting. And the people would also stand at their doorway of their tents and would face Moses' tent. And they would worship the Lord until uh, his time was over. And in one of these encounters, um, Scripture describes that the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And I think immediately we would think that face-to-face -face means literally face-to-face. -face. But we lead, you read later on in that chapter that that's not exactly what it means because of its context. But face-to-face -face denotes for us closeness, not literally face-to-face. -face because later Moses asks God in Exodus chapter 33, he says, Now show me your glory. And glory evidently was manifested in someone's countenance, in someone's face. And the Lord says, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But you cannot see my face, which tells us they didn't speak face to face, for no one may see me and live. See, even Moses, who spoke closely to God, had this proximity, spoke to God as a friend, desired to see the very face of God. So after Moses constructed the tabernacle, this place of worship, According to the Lord's instructions, Scripture says that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, this is the image of the indwelling presence of God amongst his people. Now, in the tabernacle was the dwelling place of God's presence among his people. And we'll get to that here in a second. But it pointed to something so much greater than the fact that God was just simply with them. See, God wanted to be in the midst of his people. And the tabernacle became a visual of how God was going to be in relationship with not only Israel, but really with the entire world. And God has a way of taking the visible to show us invisible truths, stuff that he wants us to know. In this case, the tabernacle was this beautiful and powerful, tangible reminder of our desire to see God and for God to be with us. The tabernacle was an image of hope and salvation for Israel and for all its people. But it's pointing to something greater, as I just mentioned. It's pointing to Jesus. 
Remember, everything in the Old Testament is about Jesus. And everything in the New Testament is also about Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, this will get a little, I think, abstract, and then we'll bring it here in for, in a second. In chapter 9, verse 11 says, But when Christ came as a high priest of good things that are now already here, he went through a greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Jump down to verse 24 of the same chapter. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Now, this whole idea of, of sanctuary, a place of worship and dwelling place, come together in, in one fell swoop. Everything about the tabernacle pointed to God's plan for the world. God's plans of redemption and reconciliation, everything from the spaces to the measurements to the furniture, the colors, even the cardinal directions in which things were facing, and all the activities that took place spoke to something greater. Ultimately, all pointing to Christ. The tabernacle was set up in such a way that it became a template for the future Jewish temple in Jerusalem. In other words, since God's inception of Israel as God's people, the tabernacle has always been the backdrop for how they understand how to relate to God. So in broad strokes, this is how the tabernacle, and the temple for that matter, was laid out. And we'll see it here in a second. See, there's, a, there's only one gate to get into the temple, into the tabernacle. It's bad for fire hazard codes reasons, but it's really good for understanding Jesus' statements later. There's only one way in. And that gate led to the outer court of the tabernacle. In many ways, the outer court pointed to the fact that salvation was available to all people. When you see the temple later established, you have the Gentiles' court within that outer court. You have courts for women and for men and different uh, functions, if you will, in groups of people. The outer court contained a brazen altar and a laver. The altar is where the sacrifices were made, and the laver was where the priest would go and wash his hands before he went into the holy place. Now, the focus of the outer courts had to do with sacrifice and judgment and cleansing of all kinds. This is the idea that the way, if you will, that Christ proclaims the outer court is really for everyone. But one keeps moving through the tabernacle, really into the Holy of Holies ultimately, but you have to go in through the holy place. And in order to get into this holy place, there is a doorway you must cross to get into that place. And only the priest could come into that area once a year. There are no bronze elements in this holy place when you walk in. Bronze, if you read scripture in the Old Testament, was really related to this idea of judgment. There's none of that there. There's been a cleansing. There's been a washing of hands. There's been forgiveness. There's been a sacrifice. And the priest now walks into this area. Now, as you walked into this into this, into this holy place that it was called. On one side, you would have the showbread, which is what Christ says later on in the book of John. He says, I am the bread of life. This is what he's referring to, this idea of bread, of God's presence, continual provision, once and for all for the people of Israel was there. Then on the other side, you had the menorah, seven lights that were to be kept lit at all times. It was the only light in this space. And it was reminded, too, when Christ comes and says, I am the light of the world, this is what he's referring to, that he's going to guide them into something greater. Then as you walk, right before you go through the veil into the Holy of Holies, there is a little altar of incense, reminding us that God is interceding for us on our behalf, but also reminding us of our prayer. So if you look at the elements that are in that space, everything from the light to the bread, believe that later on there was a pitcher of wine that was set there. Sounds a lot like communion. This whole idea, the incense, that our prayers are like incense to God. This is what the priest would enter in and into the space, but also begin to worship. Now, this place of worship is where the sanctification happened, this purification happened. Yes, there was a cleansing outside, but now in this space, he enters into this idea of being purified before he goes into the Holy of Holies. I think this applies to us, especially in our Methodist tradition as Wesleyans, we understand this to be this idea of sanctification, of being made holy, being made more into the image of God. 
So yes, we come in through the outer court, but now we're called into this more sacred space where things from our lives are shed and put aside and things are brought right and crooked paths are made straight within us and something begins to happen. This is what happens when you and I worship. And then lastly, you cross that veil and you enter into the Holy of Holies. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. There are certain items in the covenant, in the Ark of the Covenant we won't get into. But the high priest could only enter into that holy place where God's presence dwelled once a year. It was known as the Day of Atonement. They would tie a rope around the priest and the priest would go in there. If the priest wasn't in right relationship with God, immediately he would fall dead and then they had to drag, drag him out from that tent. Or if the priest went in there and left his cell phone, like, sorry, you can't get it till next year. Like it, 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 you couldn't go back in there under any circumstance. Very strict rules of how this happened. See, these images were ingrained into the people of Israel. So, the gate into the tabernacle is known as the way. The doorway into the Holy of Holies is known as the truth. And the veil was known as the life. So, when Jesus says... I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father, gets to see the glory of God except through me. This is what came up in their minds. And there's a progression to this, that you're to enter into the way, but you're not just to remain in the way. We're supposed to go all the way into life. And that's what we'll talk about next week and what that looks like for us. One of Jesus' disciples states that he too wants to see Jesus. He wants to see Jesus up close as well. Jesus had just washed their feet. He is preparing to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to be arrested and tried and then crucified. And he's telling him, I'm gonna go prepare a place for you. And Thomas said to, to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And that's where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip's like, hang on, time out. Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough. I think he's like, he's probably had too much wine. I don't think he understands what he's saying. But if Jesus, if you really know the Father the way you say you know the Father, if you could just show us, that would be great. If you have a selfie with him, there's some verification, that'd be great. That was before AI. So he was like, hey, I would really believe that's God. Or if you could show me some, some sign that God is, the Father is really with us, that would be great. These are powerful words. There's a longing, even with the disciples, those closest to Jesus, longing to see the Father. And Jesus says, you've seen him. If you want to see what God looks like, look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus. See, our God is not a God that is hiding. He's not a God that's invisible or absent. Our God has been revealing himself over and over through the beginning of time to all of humanity, through all these different places and dispensations, if you will, to all of humanity, culminating in the person of Jesus. And this is the greatest story of all time. There's no story like it. The creator steps into his own story and takes a lead role. The invisible God makes himself visible to all of humanity. This is where the author becomes the protagonist. This is the only story in which this happens. This is the story of Christmas. This is our story that continues to unfold today. The Old and New Testaments both culminating in the person of Christ. Jesus is the human face of God. Jesus is the way to the Father. This way is a way of truth. This way is a way of life. Many commentators believe that when he says the, the truth and the life, they're actually modifying the kind of way that it is. So after Moses built a tabernacle, according to God's specifications, it says that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This was a picture of how God was going to be with his people. It says that God dwelt among them, that he tabernacled with them. 
and we beheld his glory. See, Jesus was the fulfillment of the earthly, earthly tabernacle and the glory that rested upon it. It's all Jesus. This is the crescendo of Christmas. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen the glory of the glory of the one who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Now, for the law was given through Moses, Scripture says. Grace and truth came through Christ Jesus. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who he is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father has been made him known. We don't tend to read those kinds of passages around Christmas. Read about Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, but the reality of the darkness breaking forth, the light breaking forth through darkness and making himself known, revealed in Christ is Christmas. This idea of glory is Christmas, not just the shepherds that beheld the glory. You begin to see this, this thread being woven into the story. As we prepare our hearts for Christmas, it's good to keep in mind that salvation is not our idea. It's always been God's idea. The remedy for this world, for the brokenness in us and around us, is Jesus Christ. Hands down. No other remedy. Christmas is a way into that invitation. Christmas is a way for us to really see God in a different kind of way. But I think sometimes, Ricky, if we could put up that image again, I think sometimes we enter through the way and we're okay at the outer courts. Our relationship to Jesus has been reduced to simply saying sorry and doing sacrifices over and over and cleansing ourselves and dealing with shame and guilt. That's all in the outer court. We've come in through the way, but, but I think the real calling for us is to press in further into the truth. And I think when we think of truth, we tend to think of truth with the idea of contrasting that with a lie of some kind. So this is true and this is false, this is a lie and this is truth. And some of us have been thinking about truth as facts. Like there is something that is true that is also factual. The Texans quarterback, C.J. Stroud, has thrown over 300, over 3,540 yards or right at 300, 540 yards, 3,540 yards. That's a lot of yards, and the season's not over. 20 touchdowns, very impressive. That is a fact. Like, is it true? In a sense, it's true. And I get where we get those two mixed up. But something about facts that I think we mix up is that we look at our lives and we say some facts about our lives, whether you your marriage is breaking up, or you've lost a job, or you got a bad diagnosis, or your car just broke down, or whatever it is that you're going through. Like, those are facts of whatever it is you're going through. But the truth is that that's not the truth about who you are or about who God is. Sometimes we look at our facts and think that is the truth. That is a lie. Facts are facts. This is what I'm dealing with. The truth speaks to something greater, more specifically to someone greater. So truth was really referred to as God because God is good, he is steadfast, he is full of grace, he is patient, slow to anger, merciful, omniscient, sovereign. This is how the Old Testament viewed the word truth. It was mainly used to modify and to talk about God and his work, his character. Seldom was it used to depict people or facts, if you will. That's what, when Jesus uses these two words, I am, to describe I am the way, the truth, and the life, these are significant. This was a title that was used only for God. And the Jews in that time, people of Israel, understood this. And this came up all the way back in Exodus when Moses is having a conversation with God, Exodus chapter 3. And he's talking with God, and he says, God, okay, you want me to go into Egypt and help deliver your people, that's great, but how do, who do I tell them sent me? How do I prove it? I can't just say God told me, you know, like some other people do. They're not going to believe it. 
It might work here at church. Well, God told me. Well, if God told you, I can't debate that, right? And Moses is like, I know that's not going to work. How do, I, how do I tell them in a way that they will listen? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And you drop the mic and you run away. That's what you do. The way to the Father leads to truth and allows us to experience life. See, I cannot experience the full indwelling of the Father unless I go through his truth. We long for it, but we want to bypass truth. He says, I want you to enter into worship. I want you to enter into this time where I sanctify you for my express purpose and use. The truth, this idea of truth, was also a way of describing their presence with God, of being present with Christ. He says, but whoever lives by truth comes into the light. We're instructed to live out truth in our lives, living without sin. We're to love with actions and in truth, according to John. Now, John was the predominant author in the New Testament that uses this idea of truth and begins to weave it through. As children of God, as people living between these two advents, these two coming of Christ, we remember that he came in Bethlehem as a child for us, but as God's people, we're also waiting for the second advent, for Jesus to show up once and for all. This is where we find ourselves. And in that moment, in between those moments, we continue to be led by the spirit of truth, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide us into all truth. And Jesus understood this. And Jesus says in John chapter 8, he says, To the Jews who had believed in him, if you hold my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, this is powerful. I think many of us use this verse to say the truth will set you free. That's true-ish. Because listen to what it says. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Knowing the truth is what sets you free. The truth in itself will provide a way for you to know the truth. But only in knowing the truth will you actually be free. That's the invitation to enter into truth. It's a personal kind of knowing. It's intimate. It's, it's in proximity, in this case, to Christ. See, the truth has the power if we allow it to permeate every area of our lives. And as the Spirit guides us, we are sanctified by the truth, and his word is truth. This was Jesus' prayer in John 17. In other words, God's desire for us is to do a deep and lasting work that only the person and power of the Holy Spirit has the capacity to do in us. This is ultimately where the Spirit of God comes to reside in us, the glory of God. This is the culmination, I believe, of Emmanuel, God with us. You want to see God? Enter into truth, because you'll see it. And when you enter into that truth, you're going to worship God. You're going to say, God, I choose to live my life your way, not mine. And we enter into that place, yes, with brokenness, but understanding that God has been made himself flesh and bone for us. And that Jesus came and he lived and he died and then he rose again from the dead and he is coming back. And in that meantime, he says, I want to live inside of you. I want to dwell within you. I want to purify you from the inside out. That is, in essence, what the fire does. It begins to purify. He wants that intimacy, that connection with us. He wants his people to worship him in spirit and in truth because God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. I mean, think about it. This is us preparing our hearts for Christmas. Christmas is a day. Advent is a season. So for that Christmas day, I say, I'm going to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, with all that I am, with all that I have. Send it aside everything. The savior of the world, the deliverer of my soul deserves my all. And it may seem like a lot, but it's nothing in comparison to what he's done for us. So I ask, do you want to see God? Do you really want to see God? See, God has answered us in Jesus Christ. 
the tabernacle pointed us to the truth that's been given to us in Christ Jesus. The author has become the main character. And we can see God in Christ. But this tabernacle experience requires a personal encounter. This isn't something you're going to get by simply showing up on Sundays or maybe even in your small group of some kind or through some family tradition. It's saying, would you come? You're like, if I were to say, okay, how many priests in the house? Do we have any priests in the house? Y'all, this is core to who we are as Christians. And yet we don't see ourselves as priests. He says that he's now gathered people and we are a nation of priests. It's not pastors and lay people. We are a nation of priests. It means we're set aside for his purposes. We're set aside to enter into that holy place and ultimately to the holy of holies. All of us now, because that veil has been torn in Christ. Yeah, it's worth clapping for, y'all. It's freedom. It's freedom from our sin, from death, from illness, from everything. It makes this possible. And he says, now I want you to carry this out. And what's interesting is the same words that were given to Adam and Eve in the garden of keeping and caring and tending are the same words that are given to priests later in the tabernacle. See, the tabernacle is an image of the garden. The temple is an image of the tabernacle. And then what's coming is another garden. It's full circle. But all the words given there were, were words and images of us functioning as priests, covenantal language. This is the kind of God that we serve that has come after us. See, not only is Jesus our way to the Father, Jesus is always the Father's way to us. He says, I've made myself known. And I think in many ways, Advent continues to happen, this waiting, this hoping, this arrival of God. Some of us this morning are needing God to show up in our lives. You're facing grief, you're facing pain, desperation of different kinds, longing for healings, trying to figure out what's your next step, facing anxiety, depression, you name it. I know this because we're human. And to say, God, would you show up here? I want to see you here. Would you tell him this morning, God, I want to see you here. And tell him, he knows where that here is. I don't need to know. But in the same time, I wonder if we ask God, God, where do you want to reveal yourself? Where do you want me to see you? Because sometimes we get so fixated, God, I want to see you here, I want to see you here. And God says, but I'm right here. Would you turn? And that's part of God revealing himself to us. That's part of the journey of Christmas, is beginning to see God, and perhaps in the most unexpected of ways, because he has a knack of doing that, of showing up in our lives. So I want, us, I want us to pray for God to show up, for us to see God. And then I want us to worship God in song. Thanking him for what he's done, for what he's doing, for what he's gonna do. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the way you've loved us, for the way you continue to love us over and over again. You know, I pray for my brothers and sisters here who want to see you. Lord, we, we need you, as we sang just minutes ago. We need you to show up. Lord, some of us have been waiting for years, and it seems like all we hear is crickets. But God, we won't stop waiting on you to show up. Because if you're not done, and I don't believe that you are, then we're not done waiting for you. So to show up in our lives, if you have somewhere you want God to show up in your life, would you raise a hand? Somewhere in your family. There's hands all over this room. Lord, we need you. So we ask that you would draw near in Jesus' name where there is healing that is needed. Impart your healing in Jesus' name. Deliverance, provision. Let it be in Jesus' name. Those looking for jobs, those looking for new jobs, those looking to change even their minds or habits, 
leading with addictions, whatever it may be, brokenness in their own homes, darkness in their relationships. Lord, would you shine your light? Would you move? Because we want to see you. Open our eyes and our ears to see you, Lord, to welcome you. As we did not only 2,000 years ago, and we will sometime in the future, but Lord, we need you to see you. And Lord, would you speak to our hearts wherever it is that we, you're wanting to show us where you are. May we not be too proud to look to you. So we thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. In your name we pray. Amen. God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the wind may blow, I remain steadfast. And let my heart know when you speak a word, it'll come to Is your faithfulness to me? Sing that. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. Oh, great is your faithfulness to me. Yesterday, today, and forevermore. God, from age to age, the earth may pass away, the world remains the same. History can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the wind may blow, I'll remain. Stand fast and let my heart learn when you speak a word, it'll come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great, great is your faithfulness to from the rising sun, from the rising sun. To the steady same, I will praise your name. Great, great is your faithfulness to me. Oh, your faithfulness can never run out. Can never.
That is truth. That is truth. And we're going to move forward and forth from this place in his truth, being led by the Spirit. I encourage you to have a conversation with the Spirit because the Spirit will respond. When you need something, ask the Spirit. He'll reveal himself to you, reveal next steps. If you want prayer for that as we exit, I'm going to hang out here up front. You come forward and we'll pray. I think for many, this is just the beginning of a different kind of journey. To press forward in this progression to the fullness of life. So go in his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. my home.